Well, you are listening to Meeting House here on Faith Radio. Always great to catch up with Phil Cook. He is the co-founder and CEO of Cook Media Group, also the nonprofit, the Influence Lab. He is someone who is a great resource to ministries and churches. Of course, he has a presence every year, the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. We've had the opportunity to talk throughout the years at that event. Well, Phil has a brand new book. It's coming out soon and it is what I would say highly relevant to the times in which we live and of course the church can be an effective witness in the world as we continue to take our responsibility as representatives of Jesus Christ seriously but there are moments that can occur there are events that can take place crises that can really damage the the integrity and the ministry of a church. In fact, Phil has written a book called Church on Trial, How to Protect Your Congregation, Mission, and Reputation During a Crisis. Wow, what a relevant, very timely book. Phil Cook, let me welcome you to the Meeting House here on Faith Radio. I'm always thrilled to talk to you. This is fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to have the chance to chat with you. Tell me about your inspiration for writing this book. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'm the media guy. I've been the, you know, known as the media guy for years and years. And because of that, I've often got calls really for decades when a church is going through a difficult time. <clears throat> Maybe they're going through a crisis. Uh, it could be from the outside, someone protesting or causing problems at the church. It could be moral failure inside, abuse, any number of situations. And um, churches are just blindsided. They don't know what to do. Do we need an attorney? Should we release a statement? How do we tell the congregation? Should we contact authorities? There's just so many questions related to a lot of different crises that happen in the life of a church. And so I decided to put pour all those years of experience into a book to hopefully help pastors and ministry leaders really create a culture that avoids a crisis. But if one happens, how to navigate through, how to make your way to the other side, because it breaks my heart when I see so many stories of a moral, you know, a moral failure, an abuse situation, uh, some some terrible thing happened to a leader, and then the church collapses or closes. So my goal is to help the church survive and move on to the next level. That's really the motivating desire to write the book. Well, your organization has provided me with this statistic, and I'd like for you to comment on it. 27% of church members leave their faith because of leadership scandals. That's actually from a survey that was released just last year from the PRRI organization. So what do you make of that? (laughs) To me, obviously, it communicates the fact that, well, church members are watching and they really do care about this. So what are the significance? They do. And what's more tragic, Bob, is that these are not people that leave and go to another church. These are people that walk away from God entirely. Mm. I've I've got experience. I know I have a friend here in Los Angeles who, because of the way their church, her church handled a crisis, she just completely walked away from that church and just because pretty much walked away from Christianity. So you see that a lot. And so I think about it, it's more than a quarter of the church members in America walk away from God because of a crisis in a church or how poorly that church handles the crisis. So my thing is if we could fix this, if we could fix this problem, if we could button this up, it would really, you know, we, we always talk about evangelism, reaching new believers. Well, let's save the people that are in there, right? you know, as well. Let's get those, you know, let's let's cut the number of people that are leaving the church. That would make a huge difference toward impacting the culture. You're listening to The Meeting House here on Faith Radio from Cook Media Group and the Influence Lab. Phil Cook joining us today. Church on Trial is his latest book. And it's basically a book about crisis management. So obviously the the thing that gets the most headlines on social media and in, in various publications would be, I guess, in that category of moral failure on the part of a leader. Is that primarily what you deal with in the book, or are there also other areas of crisis that you address? There are many, many areas out there. In fact, it's really, really interesting. Um, there, there are every, There's everything from embezzlement. You know, it's interesting that the big churches and the well-known leaders make the headlines, but for every big church that has a crisis, I could name you five, six, seven, maybe 10 s- smaller churches out there. While I was writing the book, there was a 
small church in Alabama. The church secretary embezzled $300,000 from the church over a period of about five or six years. And they only found out when a, when a $75 check bounced and they looked into it. And she was the most trusted person in the church, according to the people there. And so that church has had to close because she'll never be able to pay that back and they can't afford to keep moving forward. So there's, you know, and the other thing too is a lot of outside crises happen. Maybe a kid breaks his leg in the playground and the parents decide to sue. Uh, maybe there's just an instigator. Maybe somebody in the community doesn't like what you're preaching. I, I often say that the most effective churches in America have a disgruntled ex-church member or disgruntled ex-staff member who's on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram constantly criticizing the church. I, I know one church in Las Vegas, great church. There's a person that used to go there that has taken out a blog. They've created a blog for the express purpose of every week they criticize that church. And a lot of newspapers and news mm -hmm. organizations will check that blog to see about stuff to write. So it, it's you can see where handling a crisis well can make a dramatic, dramatic difference for, for our perception in the community. And also, it's just a justice issue. If, if a kid is abused by a youth leader, if there's some moral failure, some problem with a pastor, we need to get that person out of there. We need to get that victim taken care of and, and helped. And we need to guide the church on how to move on to the next leader and move on from there. So there's so many areas of crisis that can potentially happen. And, and, and one thing, Bob, sex offenders are a bigger and bigger thing. As you know, the sex offender database is just gigantic here in America. And guess what? They're going to start coming to your church. And, and honestly, we want them. We want them to come and have a, have a powerful relationship with God and get their lives changed. But not everybody's coming for the right reasons. And we need to be aware of that and understand how to deal with those cases as well. So a crisis can come in a lot of different forms. And I'd like to ask you, there's been, of course, quite a bit of attention that has been focused on sexual offenses, sexual yeah. abuse. And we can think of that, of course, say in a children's ministry or a youth ministry where you have people that are not properly vetted that are are teaching or working with children or youth or whatever, but you also have other areas of sexual abuse. Share with me what you see, the, the degree of pervasiveness that is the tragedy, out there. The tragedy of sex abuse in a church, Bob, it's just, I can't overemphasize it because you've got a power dynamic here. You've got a spiritual leader that people admire. And um, number one, who's going to have enormous sway over people in the congregation or maybe people on his or her staff. And then you've got leaders like youth leaders who have access to minors. And so when that happens, we've got to stop. You know, I was reminded recently that uh, moral failure doesn't cover it. I spoke to the, the communication director of the Salvation Army, and he said, you know, we just don't even use the term moral failure anymore because people immediately go to the worst possible thing, pedophile, whatever. And so very often he said, we have to be very specific when we talk about these things. And I just think that we need to get so serious about this. In the past, pastors weren't trained for this. They didn't know how to deal with it. So they kind of either put it under a rug or maybe the victim's parents said, look, let's not make it, let's not go public with this. We don't want to ruin Johnny's high school or, or Susan's high school. We want to kind of keep this quiet. Well, today, Bob, it is illegal if you don't report it when a minor is involved. So there's so many reasons when a crisis happens, contact an attorney. I also suggest you contact a communications professional, someone like me that can help you get the right story out there in the right way. So it's, you know, I always tell people never cover anything up, never lie, always be honest. You don't have to tell the whole truth all the time. You don't have to tell the entire story every time, but tell what you know at the time, be honest, because if you try to cover something up, it will always come back and bite you. And Phil, then you have those situations where, and, and of course in this age of Me Too, where you have accusations that are made against people in leadership in a church. And we've seen numerous instances here, and there is some litigation that, that you see that's reported on. And... You know, when you see people within the church that are are making accusations about one another, that certainly doesn't contribute to the cause of Christ. But how does a, a pastor or a church leader, someone in a church that's in a high profile position, perhaps protect himself or herself from accusations that are not true? That's a great question. And the answer for me is we have to live 
a completely transparent life. I mean, I, I in my office here, I'm not even a spiritual leader. I'm just a businessman, producer, media director. And uh, but I have two or three people that have access to my email account, two or three people that have access to my calendar, uh, two or three people that have, have access to the finances. When I bring in receipts from a trip, they filter through two or three different people before they get to our CPA. And so I'm trying to make it as hard as I can not to have a rendezvous, not to schedule something with someone. I think that's important, number one. Number two, I believe in transparency, even in the physical building. When we built our building for Cook Media Group here in Los Angeles a number of years ago, I put glass windows and glass doors in every room in the building. I just believe that glass is great. You mm. can have private conversations behind glass, but you can't have any hanky-panky going around. People can see what's happening in the conference room, in his office, her office. And so I just, I've just found out that in so many cases, Bob, that I've dealt with over the years, if it was a moral issue, it happened, it started at the office. And so I think if we can open that up and make it more transparent, we can eliminate a lot of these, these situations early, early on. So I think, and I mean, if I would ask leaders to just think about all the areas of your life, when you travel, take your spouse. And if you can't take your spouse, take someone of the same sex that you trust on your team, because you just never know. Accusations can come from anywhere at any time. And so we just need to do, you know, we can't, you know, be perfect and protect ourselves all the time. But as much as possible, we need to live the kinds of life uh, that cannot be, you know, people cannot criticize. Well, you are listening to Meeting House here on Faith Radio. Phil Cook of Cook Media Group and Influence Lab joining us today, the author of the book Church on Trial, How to Protect Your Congregation, Mission, and Reputation During a Crisis. And Phil, you make the point, it's not If we'll have a crisis, it's when. And you made some great recommendations with respect to just this whole area of accusation. So how can not only church leaders and church congregations, ministry leaders, but also just each of us as individual Christians, how can we live not with a spirit of fear, but but with a spirit of wisdom and discernment to really recognize that, well, there's an enemy out there. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You've got human beings. There are going to be crises that take place. How can we develop that mentality of being able to respond wisely when a crisis occurs? I, I think the key is just being aware of it, first of all. Understand that in this digital age we live in, in this social media age, You know, there's so many ways to say something inappropriate, say the wrong thing to the wrong person, and it can just get amplified on social media. So things that would have never happened 5, 10, 15 years ago, now a lot of leaders uh, are forced to step down because of something inappropriate they said in a social media post. Um, I'm very careful about email. I understand that when you hit send on an email, you've lost control of that message. So be careful what you say. Don't criticize other people. Don't fire anybody on, on email. Don't deal with any serious subject. I will often email my CPA and ask him a financial question. And he'll always respond with, well, call me and we'll talk about it. He doesn't, he understands that, you know, you just can't control email. And that person you're sending an email to now may be your friend today, but he may not be your friend in a few weeks and he owns that email. So I'm very careful about those kind of things. Another thing I would say is just be aware of red flags. You know, we never want to make false accusations with people. And, and as Christians, we want to think the best of people. But when I go through crisis management on a, on a, on a particular issue, and after it's all over, I will often sit the staff of a church or a ministry down and say, okay, looking back over the last year or two, did you see any red flags that you didn't think about back then, but you should have noticed? And they all say, absolutely. Now I understand Mm. why Bob was doing this or why Susan was doing that or why Sam was doing this. I think red flags, you know, for instance, that, that executive pastor that comes in morning after morning with what strangely looks like a hangover Well, maybe we need to sit down and have a conversation about that. Or that staff member that comes in with the woman with bruising constantly. And we wonder, you know, is something going on at home? We want to think the best of people. So very often we ignore it when we probably should at least sit down and raise a question. And again, we don't want to make false accusations, 
But I think we do need to be more aware of, you know, that youth director that's spending a little too much time with that minor in the youth group. There's so many red flags like that that, that we don't, don't pay attention to and we really, really should. And so what's the best way when one of those red flags pops up? What do you find generally might be a principle or two that can be helpful in dealing with that? Great question. And my suggestion is go to a senior staff member, could be the pastor or executive pastor or uh, another senior staff member, and just sit down and say, you know, I've just noticed this about, about Sam. I've noticed this about Deborah, and I'm wondering if we should look into that. And so you're not saying anything on social media. You're not, you know, riling anybody up. You're not getting a bunch of people excited. Just keep it confidential. But I would go to a senior staff member uh, if you're in a church situation or a ministry situation and ask them to at least consider talking to that person or bringing it up uh, with that person privately. I think that's important. Now, if you're if you're really super friends with someone and you're starting to see red flags in their life, it's certainly appropriate for you to ask. You're their friend, you're their confidant, and it's appropriate for you to ask. But don't be accusing, because you never know. And, and I'll tell you, false accusations can destroy people's lives. They really can. So I'm really concerned about that. However, I also believe if you see, you know, at the airport, you hear the recording, if you see something, say something. If you see a suitcase left by itself off to the side, who knows, call security. I just think we should be more like that in the church today. Mm. In the book, I understand, Phil, as we wrap up, there are six types of risky conduct that you've seen play out with respect to fallen leaders. So what are those? Well, I, I can go through some of them, depending on the time, but number one is um, uh, abusing alcohol and sleeping pills. And, and I know a lot of people feel like pastors never drink, but the truth is they do. I just personally, I, I think most people would agree that the Bible doesn't necessarily prohibit alcohol. But it obviously prohibits drunkenness. Problem is with alcohol, it doesn't take much to tip, tip that scale and to be tipsy or drunk. And so we just have to be super careful. I, I knew a pastor one time that would have a few drinks at night and then go online and rant about stuff on Facebook Live. Just crazy, hmm. crazy stuff. Uh, sleeping pills are a problem with some pastors. There have been a number of crisis situations where a pastor stumbled into the wrong hotel room uh, or he said the wrong thing in a meeting or did something on an airplane just because he popped a sleeping pill. <clears throat> so I just encourage people to be really, really careful about that. I, I also think that uh, I have a category in the book I call really stupid decisions. Um, I, I think pastors and leaders of all kinds make just dumb decisions that in retrospect, we think, what were they thinking? For instance, one, one pastor I know thought to be more productive, he invited his assistant to come move into his house with he and his wife. And so you've got your female assistant now living in the same house with you and your wife. You know, the wife isn't there all the time and something's going to happen, which it did in his case. So we make, re sometimes we just, maybe we're not thinking, I don't know, but I really do believe we need to create a culture where your leaders can come around you and, and with respect, but say, you know, pastor, maybe we need to discuss this idea you're going to do or this, this this decision you've made, because sometimes out of context or when you really look at it objectively, you realize, wait a second, that's not a smart decision at all. And um, I just I, I think the more we can, you know, have that kind of an open conversation about things with our leaders, the better off we are. Great stuff for us today, Phil Cook. Church on Trial is the book. It actually officially releases on July 1st, but people can order now, right? Absolutely. You can pre-order at my website, philcook.com. I'm Cook with an E, philcook.com, and they can pre-order and be the first to get it. I'd love to see them do that. And in fact, you can pre-order it for any price. We've made it available through our nonprofit, The Influence Lab, and you can order it ahead of time and get it at whatever price you're comfortable with. That's great. Phil Cook with an E, philcook.com, Church on Trial, subtitled How to Protect Your Congregation, Mission, and Reputation During a Crisis. I think that there is something that anyone can come away with with respect to protecting themselves. And so, Phil, thank you so much for your insight. Bob, always grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.